Who would ever think of dumping seawater into a volcano? It's an idea that has led to disastrous failures in both the United States and Italy. But Iceland decided to spend millions of dollars to dump seawater on its volcano. For the first time 1.9 billion gallons of seawater, the equivalent of more than 10,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools were poured into a river of fire. For 160 days hundreds of people were exposed to molten lava with temperatures exceeding 2,000 degrees F. But what made them so determined to stop this volcano? In the war between the sea and the volcano, which side will win? To understand Iceland's decision we need to visit the island of Haimei. The island is just 4.6 miles off the south coast of Iceland, it is 5 square miles in area, and is the largest island in the Vestmanajar archipelago. Right next to Haimei is a volcano called Eldfell. For nearly 6,000 years Eldfell was thought to be dormant and the fateful night arrived. On January 21, 1973, small tremors began, but locals didn't pay much attention. Earthquakes are just part of life in Iceland. Then at 1.55 in the morning on January 23, a deafening explosion tore through the night. The ground cracked open just 650 feet from the residential area, close enough to see from the window. Flames shot up fiercely with 40 massive lava fountains lighting up the night sky. In just two days, a cinder cone over 330 feet tall formed and fast-flowing lava swallowed the land, erupting at a rate of 3,500 cubic feet per second. A terrifying flood of fire. But fate gave Haimahoy two miracles. Unusual west winds blew toxic gases away from the city, and a recent storm meant all fishing boats were in the harbor, turning them into lifeboats. In less than six hours over 5,000 residents were evacuated, leaving only a few hundred volunteers behind. The first houses near the crack were crushed by lava, and hot ash in just minutes. In some places ash piled up to 16 feet deep like a layer of black snow falling from the sky. Over 400 houses were destroyed, and dozens more were buried under thick ash. Even more worrying is the lava flow heading straight towards Haimahoy port. The harbor is the heart of the island, home to hundreds of fishing boats, and responsible for 3% of Iceland's gross domestic product. If the harbor was blocked, the country's vital fishing industry would collapse. Icelandic officials and scientists came up with a bold, almost crazy plan use seawater to cool and stop the lava. How could streams of water stand up to an erupting volcano? Previously in Hawaii and at Mount Etna in Italy, there had been some attempts to spray water on lava, but with limited success and only as experiments. This time Iceland was determined to do it on a scale never seen before. They were going to build a network of high-powered pumps and pipes that would suck up seawater from the harbor and spray it directly onto the leading edge of the lava flow. The numbers were staggering. Nearly 6.22 million tons of seawater would be sprayed continuously during the operation. But can seawater really overcome lava flows? When massive streams of seawater hit the flowing lava, the water instantly absorbed the heat, boiled violently, and turned into steam. This process sucked a huge amount of heat from the lava, causing its surface to harden into rock. As the outer layer solidified, the inside kept flowing but became compressed, making the lava bulge and slow down. As a result, cool walls formed inside the flow, blocking the advance of the fire. Scientists call these internal lava dams, barriers created right inside the lava stream. But that's not all. Because seawater was used, when the steam rose, the salt was left behind. The result huge white patches appeared on the lava's surface, covering the area like snow on a black sea. Scientists later estimated that approximately 220,000 tons of salt were deposited on the lava fields during the entire operation. There was also another effect that made the work incredibly difficult. The steam didn't just rise gently, it erupted in massive columns that shot hundreds of feet into the air. These steam plumes were so dense and so hot that they created a perpetual fog bank over the entire work area. Workers had to operate in near-zero visibility conditions, surrounded by sweltering mist that made breathing difficult and seeing almost impossible. And let's talk about the temperatures these workers were exposed to. Near the lava flows temperatures regularly reached between 2000 and 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's approximately the same temperature as molten steel in a foundry. The radiant heat alone was enough to cause burns from several feet away. Protective gear could only do so much. Workers had to move quickly, install equipment and retreat before the heat became unbearable. The theory was brilliant. The science was sound. 
but could it actually work in practice? If you find the content I share useful and interesting don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. Once the lava irrigation plan received official approval, the real work began. Workers and volunteers started spraying seawater directly onto the leading edge of the advancing lava flow. The effect was immediate and visible. Where the water hit the lava, the surface hardened rapidly. The bright orange glow of molten rock turned to dull black as it cooled. The flow rate decreased noticeably. For the first time since the eruption began, it seemed like humans might actually have a fighting chance against the volcano. But reality quickly set in. The lava mass was simply too enormous. The amount of water they could spray from portable pumps and hoses was like trying to empty the ocean with a bucket. It was having an effect, yes, but not nearly enough to stop the relentless advance toward the harbor. They needed more water, and they needed it fast. That's when a hero emerged from an unexpected place. A dredging ship called the Sandy was brought in to join the fight. The volume of water the Sandy could deliver was game-changing. We're talking about thousands of gallons per minute creating artificial waterfalls that crash down onto the molten rock, and it worked. The Sandy managed to save a critical section of the harbor by slowing and partially diverting the lava flow that was threatening to close off the entrance completely. This was a major victory. But even with the Sandy's contribution it still wasn't enough. The volcano was producing lava faster than they could cool it. The team realized they needed to think bigger and work smarter. They began constructing physical barriers, essentially walls made of cooled lava and other materials, right at the edge of the active flow. These barriers would work in conjunction with the water cooling to create multiple lines of defense. They also established a 24-hour monitoring system. Teams worked in rotating shifts, watching every movement of the lava, measuring temperatures, tracking flow rates and adjusting their water spray patterns accordingly. Bulldozers were brought in to create additional earthen barriers wherever possible. But despite all these efforts, the lava kept coming. By the end of March 1973 nearly one-fifth of the entire town was covered in lava or ash. Homes that had stood for generations were gone. Streets had disappeared. Entire neighborhoods had been erased from the map. The situation was desperate. They were losing ground literally. The harbor was still in danger. The island's future hung in the balance. They needed a miracle or at least a massive increase in their water pumping capacity. And then help arrived from across the Atlantic Ocean. The United States government shipped 32 massive industrial pumps to Jaime, each pumped out 264 gallons of water per second, enough to drain an Olympic swimming pool in minutes. As these water monsters began to run, the lava flow into the city began to slow, then stop. But the team wasn't satisfied with just stopping the lava at the town's edge. They decided to lay water pipes right on the lava field. Yes, you heard that right. Bulldozers drove straight into the flowing lava. It sounds like something out of a Hollywood movie, but the thick layer of ash on the surface created a heat shield, allowing vehicles to pass. For the first time in history, humans drove over a river of fire, on steep sections that were impassable, workers had to do it by hand, pulling lengths of pipe to connect them to pumps in the harbor, working in a cloud of steam. They didn't just use steel pipes, they also used plastic pipes with water running through them, which were lighter and more heat resistant, stretching 330 to 650 feet into the lava. Every time a pipe broke due to shifting lava, they replaced it and kept pumping. For 15 days the pumps ran continuously. Nearly 132 million gallons of seawater were poured onto the burning lava in this concentrated assault. The steam clouds were so massive they could be seen from the mainland. The sound of boiling water and cracking rock was constant and deafening. And then something remarkable happened. A massive wall of cooled solidified lava began to form. This wasn't just a thin crust. This was a genuine barrier, thick and stable that physically blocked the path of the molten lava still flowing behind it. The wall grew taller and wider as more water was applied, and incredibly the lava flow began to divert around it away from the town and away from the harbor. The unthinkable had been achieved. Humans had built a dam out of the volcano's own lava and used it to redirect the eruption. But this raises a fascinating question. Why did this work so spectacularly in Iceland when similar attempts elsewhere had failed? Iceland's triumph wasn't just about bravery, it was about timing, luck and precision. Every factor had to align perfectly, remove one and the entire mission would have failed. First, distance. The Eldfell volcano erupted barely a kilometer from the town center and harbor, close enough for disaster, yet close enough for salvation. Equipment could be rushed in within minutes. There was no mountain crossing, no long transport. 
Everything they needed was within reach. Second, the lava's pace. Unlike the furious flows of Hawaii, Eldfell's lava crept forward slowly. That sluggish movement gave engineers time, time to think, adapt, and fight back. Every extra hour was a small victory. Third, the sea itself. The harbor gave direct access to the Atlantic, an endless source of cooling water. Pumps could draw continuously, pouring the ocean onto the volcano's fire. Fourth, infrastructure. For a small island, Iceland was remarkably prepared. Sturdy roads, a working harbor, reliable communications. When 32 American pumps arrived they were installed within hours. Finally, timing. The eruptions struck in winter, when the fishing fleet was safe in port. A storm that once seemed like misfortune, turned out to be a blessing. Thousands of sailors were spared. All these elements came together in a moment of impossible balance. Change one detail. Faster lava, weaker roads, a dry harbor, and the story ends differently. Iceland didn't just fight nature, it fought under perfect fleeting conditions. Even then the struggle lasted half a year, a test of endurance few nations could have survived. By May 1973 the battle against the volcano had raged for over three relentless months. Exhaustion was everywhere, crews worked in shifts, but the strain was written on every face. Pumps thundered day and night, their metal shells corroded by salt and heat, pipes burst, machines failed, and yet, the lava was finally weakening. The eruption that once roared with fury was beginning to fade. The volcanic cone now named Eldfell had grown to over 200 meters high, a monstrous monument to nature's power. But the lava fountains were smaller now, the tremors softer. The earth itself seemed to be exhaling after months of rage. Still no one dared to celebrate. The question hung in the air. Would the harbor survive, or would it be buried forever? Teams continued spraying seawater without rest. Every cooled meter of lava meant another piece of the island saved. Through endless trial and error the workers had become pioneers of a new science, experts in fighting fire with the ocean itself. By June the lava's advance had stopped. The volcano's fury met its match in human persistence. The harbor entrance though scarred and narrowed remained open, enough for ships to pass, enough for life to continue. Then on July 10, 1973 the pumps were finally silenced. After 160 days of continuous battle, Iceland had done the impossible, stopped a volcano, but as the steam cleared and the island stood quiet, one question remained, had Haimadi been saved, or merely survived? The numbers from the eruption were staggering. A total of 1.9 billion gallons of seawater had been pumped onto the lava. That's enough water to supply a city of 100,000 people for an entire year. The amount of material ejected from Eldfell was equally massive approximately 8.8 .8 billion cubic feet of lava and ash. This was enough material to bury the entire original island under several meters of volcanic debris. The physical transformation of Haimadi was dramatic. About one square mile of new land had been added to the island, increasing its total size by roughly 20%. The island was literally bigger than before. But this growth came at a terrible price. Over 400 homes were completely destroyed. Entire neighborhoods had vanished under lava and ash. Streets that once bustled with life were now buried under meters of black rock. The harbor, the economic heart of the island had survived but was fundamentally changed. The entrance was now much narrower than before. The lava flow that had threatened to block it completely had instead created a natural breakwater. This new formation actually provided better protection from Atlantic storms. What had seemed like a disaster had accidentally improved the harbor's design. Ships were safer. Docking was more protected. The fishing industry could not only survive but potentially thrive. The financial cost of the water spraying operation was approximately 1,547,742 Icelandic krona at the time. In today's money that equals about $8 million. It sounds expensive, but consider the alternative. If the lava had continued for just one more month without intervention it would have completely blocked the harbor. The fishing industry would have collapsed. The island would have been abandoned. The economic loss would have been in the hundreds of millions. 3% of Iceland's entire GDP would have disappeared overnight. The operation wasn't just successful. It was one of the best investments Iceland ever made. $8 million to save an entire island, an entire community and a vital piece of the national economy. The return on investment was incalculable. Yet beyond the numbers one question lingered. After facing nature's wrath, would people ever return to live on Jaime again? The first residents began returning to Jaime in the summer of 1973, 
Even before the eruption had completely ended, they came back to a landscape that was almost unrecognizable. Black ash covered everything. The new volcanic cone loomed over the town like a dark monument. Streets were buried. Homes were crushed or burned. The air still smelled of sulfur. It looked like the surface of another planet. But these people were determined. Jaime was their home. They had built lives here. They had families, businesses, and memories tied to this island. They weren't going to let a volcano take that away. The cleanup began immediately. Bulldozers cleared ash from streets. Crews began demolishing buildings that were too damaged to save. Slowly, painfully, the island started to come back to life. By 1974, the fishing companies were back to their previous production levels. The harbor was operational. Boats were coming and going. The economic engine of the island was running again. This was remarkable considering that just a year earlier the entire island had been evacuated and partially destroyed. The speed of recovery shocked observers around the world. By the end of 1975 approximately 85% of the original population had returned to Jaime. Some chose to stay on the mainland unable to face the trauma of returning. Others had found new opportunities elsewhere. But the vast majority came back. They rebuilt their homes. They reopened their businesses. They resumed their lives. The island that had faced total destruction was alive again, and just as they thought the story had ended, the volcano that destroyed them revealed an astonishing secret, it had given them a gift beyond imagination. The lava flows that had threatened to destroy Jaime were still hot, not surface hot but deep internal heat that would last for years. The rock's extremely low thermal conductivity meant that the interior of the flows could remain several hundred degrees for a decade or more. This residual heat was enormous and someone realized it could be useful. Scientists began investigating whether the heat from the cooling lava could be harnessed for practical purposes. The idea was simple but revolutionary. Pump water through pipes buried in the hot lava. The water would heat up naturally. This hot water could then be used for heating homes and generating electricity. It was free energy courtesy of the volcano that had tried to destroy them. Experimental heating systems were developed and tested. The results were promising. By 1974 the first house on Haimai was connected to a geothermal heating system powered entirely by the cooling lava flows. More homes followed, then businesses, then public buildings. For years after the eruption the lava provided the islanders with cheap reliable heat and hot water. The volcano had become a power plant. The volcanic ash which had buried so much of the island also found new purpose. It was used to extend the runway of the local airport, making it longer and safer. It was used as landfill material to create new building sites. Homes were constructed on land that hadn't existed before the eruption. The material that had destroyed the old island was being used to build the new one. Even the salt deposits left behind by the seawater spraying became a curiosity. The white flakes covering the black lava created a unique landscape that attracted scientists and tourists. People wanted to see the place where humans had fought a volcano and won. Hime became famous worldwide, not as a disaster site but as a symbol of human resilience and ingenuity. The island that had faced destruction had been transformed into something stronger, more efficient and more remarkable than before. But one question remained, could it happen again? And that's the incredible story of how Iceland fought fire with the sea and won. From destruction came rebirth, turning a deadly volcano into a source of life and energy. What do you think? Was this the boldest act of human courage in modern history or just pure luck? Share your thoughts in the comments below, we'd love to hear them. If you enjoyed this story of resilience and science against the odds, don't forget to leave a like, share this video with your friends and subscribe to the channel for more amazing stories from around the world. And of course, turn on the notification bell so you never miss our next deep dive into Earth's most extraordinary events. Thanks for being with us on this great journey. Leave your thoughts in the comments and like to help us. Remember to subscribe for more. See you soon.